Can you hear me okay? Great. Well, Happy New Year, and thank you for being here tonight as we embark on the journey of uh, selecting our next police chief for the city of Grand Rapids. Uh, I do want to uh, begin by thanking uh, Chief Payne for his leadership over the past couple of years uh, and has done a, a good job leading us through some very difficult times. And so um, I appreciate it, but we are looking forward to the next chapter uh, in our city's future. And tonight we have uh, candidates, we have guests, they are guests in our city. And we welcome them as they continue to be a part of this interview process. Uh, and just like we're interviewing them, they're also interviewing us in our community. And they've had a long day today as they've had several meetings since 8 o'clock this morning and will continue to be meeting with you, both uh, those of you who are here and those uh, that are joining us online virtually. We'll have more information about the details for participation, but I want to thank uh, our partner and uh, consultant that has been helping us through this very important uh, decision, uh, Mr. Gary Peterson, who is the present CEO of Public Sector Search Consulting Firm and has done a good job in helping us uh, engage both community as well as bringing us uh, some very qualified candidates for us to consider tonight. So I want to thank him as well and thank all of you uh, for being here. This is a very important decision, one in which I am responsible for making but choose not to make alone and need the engagement of both our community as well as members of the city staff, uh, department uh, staff, both in the police department, outside the police department, other law enforcement agencies, residents, neighborhoods, businesses. Uh, this is uh, part of the inclusive process that we've embarked for this very important decision. So I want to thank you for being here. And so you'll hear from the candidates shortly. They will uh, come out, uh, and Ms. Peterson will now uh, provide us a little bit about the uh, process for tonight. Before I sit down, I would like to thank our city commissioners for being here, uh, Commissioner Sasi, Commissioner Jones, Commissioner Moody, Commissioner O'Connor, and um, did I miss anyone? Did I miss anyone? I want to make sure we acknowledge the commission. I did see uh, other elected officials here. I see that our county uh, commissioner, Womack, he was here earlier, and our Kent County uh, prosecutor, uh, Becker, to see him here this evening, and others. And if, if I, it's hard to see with mask on, I'll just tell you. First of all, I wear glasses. Secondly, it's hard to see with mask <laughs> on. So thank you all. Thank you. But most importantly, again, thank all the residents for being here. Uh, who really make up the very vital, important part of our community. So with that, I will um, now toss it to uh, Ms. Peterson. Thank you, Mark. Appreciate it. Uh, tonight, um, you'll be hearing from three candidates. Uh, they'll all be asked questions that were submitted by community members through an online survey tool um, or submitted on YouTube or Facebook uh, through the virtual space or a question from members of the audience um, who are, are here today. I want to make everyone aware that there are comment cards on the table outside the commission chambers, and we'd encourage you to complete those comment cards at the end of the night. And so uh, City Manager Washington has that additional feedback from the community. You know, and when we did this, when we collected the survey, we got 46 results from the community. Um, and of those 46 results, there were numerous questions in those. So we combined those questions with similar questions and then edited, edited them for clarity. So based on the turnout tonight, I'm, I'm not sure we'll get to all of those questions uh, from my space, but I'm sure we want to hear more from the community than me. But I want to respect and honor those who uh, submitted questions online. So the format for tonight is we're going to see each candidate for approximately 35 minutes uh, separately. And we're going to provide each candidate with an opportunity to introduce themselves and, and tell the community why they want to be the police chief here in Grand Rapids. And then I'll ask a question that was submitted or formulated for each candidate. And then I'll invite members of the community to the microphone uh, to ask a question. Um, and if your question has already been asked and answered, um, I will point that out and ask you to ask a, a different question, please. And when someone submits a question online, 
I'm going to get a notification and I may intermittently um, let you know that I'm asking a question that was submitted in the virtual space. So with that having been said, I would like to invite uh, Chief Jim Blocker from Battle Creek, Michigan to the podium. He's our first candidate. Thank you, Chief. And Chief, would you take three or four minutes to tell the Grand Rapids community about yourself and, and why you want to be the police chief here? Yeah, thank you. Well, first of all, thank you all for coming out here tonight. Uh, it is cold, it is windy, and to have this kind of showing speaks more about the community and yourselves than anything else. You know, when we moved, I lived in Grand Rapids with my wife uh, about 26, 27 years ago. We both went to school here, and subsequently our two oldest children have gone to school here. And we've been back and forth from Grand Rapids for just a number of years, pretty much my, throughout my entire tenure. When I first started considering getting into law enforcement, when I was young, about 27 years ago, I got to know a man by the name of Jerry Steele. He's a retired deputy chief out of Grand Rapids Police Department. He worked at Calvin, uh, where I had worked and where I went to school. And I have to tell you, as I got to know him, and the man of integrity that he was. And I had gotten to know Chief Hegarty just by uh, attending talks uh, as he had come to the campus from time to time. I realized, you know, one of the best departments in the state of Michigan is the Grand Rapids Police Department. I knew it, and I believed it, and I wanted to be a part of it. But you know, I went to the academy after, after uh, college, and I started the process to uh, join the, the uh, department. And it was the only department that I really put in for, right? Now, the competition was stiff. There was about 1,000 people in the room that day when we were competing. Considerably different than today, right? But I went through the process and all the steps, and, and ultimately, they eventually said yes. The problem is Battle Creek said yes first, and I had a young family. And I'd been there already four months, and I just couldn't do it. I couldn't turn everything in. I couldn't turn it all away. And I couldn't return uh, at that time. But I thought, boy, I, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go back there one day. Because truly, that's what I felt. It was, it was the number one department. Well, life just happens. And you don't get back well until now. You know, I've seen Grand Rapids transform itself. I, I remember what Grand Rapids was even before the Van Andel was there. I remember uh, you, it was, you were told in school that really it's not safe to walk down Division. Well, I ran it this morning. That goes to show how this city has been resilient and not only has, has thrived in the last uh, 30 years, but has been an extraordinary good at it. And they've built a level of resiliency here uh, in this city uh, that we've all come to expect and love and appreciate. There's a level of richness and diversity here that all of us can ultimately appreciate. And so you might ask why, and believe you me, folks in my own community have asked, why would you put in for it? right? Because things are going well. I, I live in a wonderful community. They've allowed me to dream. They've allowed me to do wonderful things, right? And they've given me the freedom through the community support to do them. But the reason why is I think that law enforcement in general, we are at a, this is a pivotal moment, a real pivot point. As we've come away from defunding the police back to refunding the police, but the key here is the community is going to demand, demand that we do it differently. And I feel to a certain extent we've been doing that because we had to in Battle Creek because we didn't have the resources and the capability and perhaps the death, but you've got them here. And so if there was one town that I thought professionally I wanted to, to put in for and where I may, with the community support, have the opportunity to see, get that groove back for GRPD, right? Bring the magic back of who they were, but just as importantly, do it with the community, it would be this one. And so it was worth the risk to put in, even though we share the same media market. You know what we're doing down there, just like we know what you're doing up here. My, my city knows that I'm up here. Um, and, and that's why I put in for it, because I think it's worth it. I think it's, uh, you've demonstrated that. 
and I think, frankly, it's a real honor and a privilege I've made it this far. So thank you. Thank you, Chief. <clears throat> okay, your first question is, there have been, start prefaced with a statement, of course, uh, there have been a couple of recent officer-involved shootings in Battle Creek. What's been your approach to communicating information to the public on these type of incidents, and how have you balanced the need to be transparent with the community and being supportive of your employees, especially before the investigation is completed? Yeah, thank you. Um, you know, I think years ago we tried to not necessarily control the media or the news, but we tried to make sure what we had was, was right before we got it out there. Today, that's not something, that's not a luxury we can enjoy and perhaps wasn't one we should. Because the news right now is going to get out there. Uh, uh, social media is an entire bandwidth that has, as it's existed, the information is going to get out there and it's incredibly important today, certainly for law enforcement, to exercise that sense and live that sense of transparency is to get the information out as soon as you practically can. The advent of, uh, although you'll maybe hear me talk about technology doesn't replace relationships, the advent of the body-worn camera and the in-car camera and those systems to be able to communicate and show and share what actually happened has really revolutionized our ability to take what happened and within hours put it back out there for the, for the community to see. The community deserves to know. They have a right to know. Now whether they actually believe it or we agree on what you're seeing, that's another discussion for another day. But in the last 60 days, we've had at least three critical incidents that was paramount. It was important that within hours we get those body camera videos out there. We tell the story. And perhaps many of you even may have even seen many of those stories. How does the community react? They really don't. It's an expectation that they've gotten used to, that we get the information out as soon as we can. And, uh, and that's simply why I do it. Thank you, Chief. Yeah, at this time, I'll invite uh, anyone that has a question to step up to the lectern and, and ask it. Okay, please uh, state your name and where you're from, please, for the record. How you doing, Mr. Blocker? My name is DeAndre Jones. I stay here in the city of Grand Rapids. I'm very, very active in the community. Uh, I just want to know, uh, with the third ward being the ward that's the least invested, I know as you know, as a police chief, uh, when as you talked about resources, there isn't a lot of investment and that causes a lot of poverty, that causes a lot of violence. So from an equity lens, as the, uh, one of the two Caucasian candidates for this position on that, it's a black man also, how do, you, uh, how do you see an officer as an equitable officer and how do you plan to, if you're uh, granted this job, how do you plan on uh, basically, um, I wouldn't say looking at it from a humanitarian side, but just as uh, problems happen over there on the third ward, how do you plan to manage those problems and being able to handle those problems knowing that uh, that is one of the least invested wars, but also one of the wars that has a lot of the problems? Thank you, DeAndre. That's a, that's a first world problem. There's a level of complexity that you've introduced into the room that isn't just a law enforcement problem. I, and I agree with you in that sense, it's a, it's a community problem. And, and as law enforcement, we can't see um, sectors or wards or communities that have been then for whatever reason seem to have not the investments haven't been made as they should uh, in those particular areas you know there are parts of this city and parts of the city that i'm in that where, where really people don't need us they're, they're self-sufficient right but there's other parts of this city that they need us and they need us more than anything else. Matter of fact, the one thing that often will show up and respond to the trauma in their lives because of 911 or whatever is, is because they don't have the support. And our role is to help them and to support them. But we cannot do it alone. It's got to be a unified approach. There are multiple different challenges every call we take in these neglected areas right, where poverty is intense, addiction is intense, with all of those social challenges that exi exist there, law enforcement isn't the only one that needs to be responded because we've got a very narrow focus and perspective. And so if we really want to address the problem, if we really want to, under we first have to understand the why. Why is this happening? 
I can give you an example. You know, you can go to a, a barking dog call. Someone called 911, there's a barking dog, the officer shows up. What's the officer looking for? The crime, right? And maybe the only crime is, is the noise ordinance violation. But the reality of it is, when you crack open the door, you see there's no food in the fridge. You see there's children that have been neglected. You see that it's during the day and they're not in school and they probably should, should be. And perhaps you see other challenges. The key is having officers that have the capacity, depth, and reach to reach out to the right resources and have them on the spot. Uh, in support of you. And I don't mean that 1-800 number. I mean you can reach out and call, call Megan from Mental Health. You can reach out and call someone that you know, you've worked with, co-responded and trained you. And in our community about seven years ago, uh, we started to build out what we call our Community Fusion Center. Matter of fact, we started it, the concept in our old facility and I was blessed enough to be able to build a brand new headquarters and we actually designed it around this concept of the fusion center and that means bringing in those skills and 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 those resources uh, to come in train work with and support and ultimately one day the holy grail is co-respond with us so once the officer responds to the barking dog right they're able to stabilize it, secure it, stabilize it, but ultimately hand it over to the right people to actually start to address the multitude of problems that are existing in that home. Multiply that by 10 homes, 20 homes, and 500 response later, and then now suddenly you're starting to make a change. Now 911 means something. And, and, and that's, of course, that's the direction that we have been taking uh, for some time. And, I, and again, it, um, law enforcement will always struggle. There will always be this sense of turbulation and agitation if one part of our community feels like they're not getting the service like everybody else. And the best way to deal with it is address it, but address it appropriately. I hope that answers your question, DeAndre. It does. Thank you. Yes, sir. Thank you. Uh, ask someone else to step up to the lectern. Good evening. Uh, my name is Lucas Leverett. I've been here for seven months from Nashville, Tennessee. So I had an intro written. I'm just going to wing it. As a fellow out of towner, I believe that having three candidates that don't come from the ranks is a good thing. I've seen it affect positive change in Nashville. Best things we did were out of towners. Uh, I would like to piggyback a question, Gary, if you get a chance after this. I would like to know the fate of female candidates. We do have an all male panel tonight, but we have a lot of great women serving. So I'm curious about how that worked out, if you can address that after we're done. Uh, Mr. Blocker, I appreciate you being here. I hope the other gentleman can hear the intro portion because I'd hate to repeat it, but during the process, each of your resumes and biographies have been a focal point offered to the public for review. In those, we can see a variety of backgrounds that speak well of your qualifications and in some cases raise red flags in other ways, depending on the perspective brought to the equation. Mr. Blocker, your profile highlights a heavy overlap of military service. This isn't much of a departure from the already overly militarized police presence in America. The 1033 program is regarded by many now to be a wrong-headed effort to continue the jingoistic posture of police who tend to regard the citizenry as a hostile opposition force. Given that GRPD has recently faced scrutiny over a lack of transparency regarding what sorts of implements of warfare they've acquired, how would you address the negative connotations as well as the advantages of your military background, sir? Thank yeah. you. Thank you, Luke. It's a uh, good point. I, I think in general it's... Um, let me tell you a story about my military training and my background. Because most people think it's all about full metal jacket. Well, that's so 60s and 70s. Let me tell you how they prepared me. And more importantly, let me tell you how the community prepared me for war, right, and how war prepared me to even better serve my community. When we first got to Afghanistan, our brigade commander was insisting we conduct, he was an infantryman, we conduct tactical operations in and around the region. Those were called cordon and searches for, for MPs, which meant we went in in the early morning hours. And on these hot days, and they were truly hot days, um, the men would leave really early in the morning and they wouldn't come back until mid-afternoon. And so what did that mean? That meant 
right after the men left, we would show up, not intentionally, it's just the way it happened, right? And we'd start to search and for illegal weapons, and contraband, explosives, and, and all the things that were a threat to us because we were under a threat, a high threat at the time. You know, the only thing we really accomplished by doing that was, was ticking off a bunch of mothers and, and scaring a bunch of children. And, and then, more importantly, when those husbands would come home, whether they were a member of ISIS or the Taliban or not, boy, they sure thought about it because they had to deal with that. An angry wife and, a, and upset children. We weren't making friends. So I started to think differently, and I said, listen, sir, you know, what do you think if we, instead of doing it this way, why don't we throw a party? Not figuratively. Why don't we get to know the elders? And why don't we see if we can meet with them, join them, have tea, ultimately share a meal together. And, and you know what? And I told him, I explained to him my experience with community policing. I explained to him and closing the gap and developing and deepening the relationship and deeply listening to the concerns of the community. Not the problem we thought existed, but the real problem because they know it more than we do. I think it's going to be a better approach. Not only was it a better approach because it was lessons learned in my own community that I could apply, but the military also taught us that, listen, we're, we're all about thinking differently. The one value of the military, unlike many militaries across the country or across the globe, and I have been um, in a room with many of them, is the U.S. military is so incredibly diverse. We have so many different perspectives. We can be so much more creative in everything we do. The one thing frustrates our enemy is we don't follow our own doctrine. Whereas many of them are, are incredibly homogenous and closed-minded and just do things a certain way. So knowing that, these ideas about the Fusion Center, um, trying to work with and relate to the community, is pretty, that's what the military, that's the gift and the benefit that the military has given me. You're talking about the 1033 program and the militarization of police. There, clearly, there's malevolent actors out there that want to hurt your sons and daughters who serve as police officers. And we have to do all that we can reasonably to protect them. But that doesn't mean you have to pull it all out right at once. Sometimes the community just wants to vent. Sometimes they want to protest. Sometimes they want to express their anger as loudly and as freely as you can. Well, why don't you let them? And we certainly did that in Battle Creek during, after the George Floyd murder. Uh, we let them, and we had no instances. Did I have the capability to respond if things turned violent? Sure, we had decision points and sort of areas that we would watch for, but you know what? We made sure that we were fully supporting them. And none of that was out. None of that was presented. Because, you know, you present that stuff, folks are so frustrated, they're so angry, they're like, you want to fight? Okay. Well, I'll fight. But we didn't want to fight. We wanted them to vent. And that's a perspective, you know. That's an attitude, and I'd like to think that's mine. Thank you, Chief. And before I invite the next person to the lectern, um, I had a, a question from the, the virtual space uh, from one of the uh, streaming platforms. If selected as a new police chief for Grand Rapids PD, how, what would your approach be to gaining or earning the community's trust? You know, <clears throat> I tell you, the moment you can seize a person's trust, that one interaction at a time, is the moment you should never let go and you should exploit it as often as you can. Um, one way I do that, I shared earlier, is about getting the information out there. There's really no secrets in policing. There's really nothing that we need to necessarily protect unless we're trying to protect the integrity of a case and the a life of a victim, right? Well, I, but I think we all appreciate that. But that, that transparency and that sense and understanding of what is going on, how and why we do things, is very much a part of our role in policing. You can't just make an assumption everybody understands it. We had an officer involved shooting several years ago, and uh, an officer was shot three times. He just about didn't make it. And when that happens, 
everyone shows up. I mean everybody in support. Why? Because somebody has done something uh, that means that they're desperate. And if they're going to shoot an officer, an armed officer, right, one of your officers, right, who carry your authority, then they're more than willing to do anything. And they're going to be desperate. And so we responded to that. We ended up apprehending the man safely, securely. He was brought to justice. Things were relatively clean, and the officer survived. And it's, and it's doing, doing well. See, the thing is, we had a community meeting. And there was a lot of frustration. And at first, I'm like, why are we having this meeting? I, we got out in front of this. We, we told everybody what, what was going on. But the thing about it is the meeting, once I realized it, the meeting wasn't about what we did. It was, why don't you do that every time someone is killed in our neighborhood? Why did you pull it all out just for this one person? And we can't make the assumption people understand the mindset. And once we were able to walk them through why this was such a desperate attempt to find this suspect and the concern and the fear that he was going to do it again, we regained that trust because we were able to show them. The other thing we told them is that with nearly 100% clearance rate, when we have a homicide, they didn't know, but we pull out the entire team. I have no less than 23, 25 folks working a single homicide in that first 72 hours. After that, your hope of evidence really results in that of diminishing returns. And so, and I think that is one reason why we pull it all out. They're costly, they're expensive, but I think a human life is worth it. But we owe it to the community to explain that. Uh, and so that's why. Thank you, Chief. Yes, sir. I invite the uh, gentleman to the podium. Thank you. Good evening. Um, Good evening. My name is Johnny Brand. I am a president of Voice for the Badge, a group in Grand Rapids that supports our police. And I want to make it clear right now that we support our police, but we're not against any groups otherwise. The inner city needs funding, but don't get it from the police budget because we don't have enough officers now. Find money within the budget and some of the fat, get it out of there and use it for the right thing, which is to help the inner city. And I stand behind that 100%. But I'm not really impressed. You sound like you're more apologetic to do this right for them. How about the police? How about your police? They have the worst morale here right now you could imagine. We're short officers. They're working like heck. No appreciation, no respect. And, and I'm, I'm just saying from the city all over. But we need officers. I mean, the response times are high. I mean, you've got to deal with these things. You've got to go before a commission. One wanted to be fun, and she didn't know what she was talking about. It was reckless. She was a freshman commissioner. She doesn't like police from a pre, uh, an incident in the past for herself. Mr. Brand, do you have a question? <laughs> yes, the, I do. The chief? I'm sorry. Yeah, I'm Could sorry. Could you state it, please? I will. Thanks. Um, as far as uh, how are you going to address the fact that we need additional funding for the GRPD, if you agree? You know, I was asked, I'm going to answer, I guess I'll answer your question that angularly, right? Um, I've been asked by many chiefs, local chiefs, hey, why are you putting in from Grand Rapids? Things are going well where you are. Why are you, why are you trying? The simple answer is because there's cops here. And I love cops. I love the work they're willing to do for, on our behalf. I recognize the fact that when they close their eyes at night, they see things that most of us don't have to see because they take it all in. I recognize the sacrifices that they make. I recognize that roughly one out of four has a substance abuse problem and the divorce rate is over 50%. That's a problem. So to belay any concerns about where my, how my head and my heart is connected as, uh, depend, as it relates to a police officer, I hope that's clear. I also hope you understand that we have relied on police officers to sort of do everything. And there's, that's where the agitation is. And, they, and, you know, officers will do anything you tell them to do. They will. Even if they don't have all the skills and the tools, they will do it. They will go there and do it with the training that they had. The challenge we're having in most communities today, they go there, they respond with the training they had. They've done everything we've asked them to do. They've taken the risk. And yet, at the end of the day, the public's still dissatisfied because we didn't solve the problem. And so, obviously, th there has to be more resources. You can't, you can't change a culture or even reform a police agency without, on the cheap without spending a little bit of money. You can't. You absolutely can't. 
but ideally the, the, the holy grail of where the ends, ways and means and where we ultimately want to go is we'd like to get to a point where the right people with the right training are responding to the calls for service and these, and these issues are being resolved and the end state there is you start going to that call less and less and less and then we got, start to use our officers for what they were really trained for to respond to the malevolent actors in, in your community that are making it very difficult for everyone else to live and work, play and survive. And, um, and that's really my perspective on that and I hope I answered your question. Yes, sir. Go ahead. Hi, how are you? Good. Good, my name is Paige Maz. Um, been a citizen in this city of Grand Rapids for about 10 years. Um, I've called the city home. I was born and raised in Kent County. So I want to further address more specifically. Um, the fact of the matter is in this city, we are nearly working with double of crime on an exponential rate. In addition to that, our service calls for our officers are nearly doubling, specifically from maybe 70,000 to 110, 120,000 calls, but we're still dealing with the same number of street officers. So my question specifically is, how would you address the fact that there is a shortage in street officers currently, and how are we going to figure out a way to reallocate out of the current budget to address that current issue? Because as a citizen that lives in the city, I'm, I'm seeing a decline on my streets. Neighbor families are leaving. Yeah. I've had my car broken into five different times within the past year. The loitering, the looting, it's on the rise. And our street officers are becoming overworked. That's a, that's a familiar problem. Thank you, Paige. I think we need to be honest about ourselves and see ourselves a little more clearly. Crime is on the rise, and there's a multiple different reasons for that. You know, some of it is because of the massive amount of guns out there, right? Some of it is because of COVID and the, and the reduction of social support programs out there or the lack of interaction. Some of it is because law enforcement naturally has pulled back because of COVID restraints, or some of it is simply depolicing because they don't want to take the risk. Right? There's a multitude of reasons. There's just no one thing. Matter of fact, criminologists are still arguing why crime went down in the 90s. So they're currently studying why this phenomenon is happening right now. But, but to your point, you can't also draw the conclusion that more cops is going to actually reduce crime. I think it may. I think, you need, I think a better way of approaching it is the and-and solution, which is, as I said earlier, uh, you, can't, you can't reform, you can't address community violence on the cheap. You're going to have to make the investment just like you've done throughout the entire city, right? And the benefits of doing that are going to create a secure and a stable environment so you're not worried about your car being broken into. Of course, I'm concerned of the safety of the citizens. So if you're, not, if you're not concerned about your car being broken into or the safety and security, you perceive that there's a sense of that this is a safe and secure operating environment, you're willing to stay here, invest here, and make a life here. But it isn't just on law enforcement. And that's where I'm going to, I'm going to I keep trying to, to explain that, yes, law enforcement has a significant role in this equation and the work forward. We do. We do it every day. And it's a similar problem in my community. Uh, but we also know there's a lot of other agencies with budgets themselves that can contribute to help support some of these challenges and most of them are not just complicated, they're complex. Um, but I don't disagree and I, I'll just reiterate, you can't do it on the cheap because if that's where you're saving money, uh, it's just <coughs> not going to work. Thank you, Chief. And before I ask the next person to come up and ask a question, I'm going to provide you with a question from the virtual space. Um, are you familiar with the cure violence model? And if so, how are you prepared to partner with cure violence? I am not familiar with the cure violence model. Okay. That's a, that's right. a, thank you, sir. And I'll invite uh, the next person. Thank you, ma'am. Good evening. My name is Sarah Hampton, and I'm a resident of Ward 3. And um, I do support law and order, but I do not support police misconduct. So my question is, 
uh, what policies are you going to are you going to implement to ensure accountability for officers who engage in continued acts that violate department policy and create harm and disharmony within the community. And um, I say that because uh, you can't blanket an entire police department. My daughter was a police officer, so this isn't, this is for those that continuously harm our citizens, continuously misconduct, harassment, you know, um, they say that they want to be transparent and I heard you mention that, but we want to see true transparency. We want to know that the, our departments, our police officers can be trusted all of the things that are going on in our city right now, um, there's problems. So I would like to know how do you plan to correct those problems, um, those officers who are dishonoring that badge of honor. What are your plans? What are your goals? And Battle Creek is a little different, but I'm sure you have the same problems. We just have it on a larger scale. And I would like to know, Mr. Blocker, is it? How are you planning to solve these issues? Thank you, Sarah. I appreciate the question. Uh, you know, um, we started a, a program some time ago. Uh, gets back to that, um, earning the trust of our community. And I'll give you a story. We had a pastor who gave us a call and said, hey, you know, one of my members uh, had a confrontation with a law enforcement officer. And what happened was it was an expired plate and the officer stopped him. He kind of took off a little bit and eventually the, the stop was made and uh, the license was uh, improper and there was a fight and there was a struggle because the, the driver himself, right, uh, knew that he had fulfilled his plates, right? But it hadn't caught up. The record hadn't caught up, so the computer said they weren't, and yet the, officer, the, the driver felt that he was. And so pastor, the pastor called up and said, can I look at the video? And I said, absolutely, why not? Come on down. I hadn't even seen the video either. No formal complaint had been fired, filed. We just let him come in and watch the video with us, hit play. You can't put the toothpaste back in the tube. You just got to let it go. It's, it, it is what it is. And so we allowed, we let him freely watch that. And when he was able to see what happened visually and understand the circumstances, we then had a unique opportunity in this case, but we've done it many times since, is to grab the officer and that person again and come together. They eventually did a ride along together. See, that's that restorative piece. There's the, there's the action, and there's how we react in a way that's fully transparent, and then ultimately it's the restore, restoration piece. And, and that is key. That officer learns a little bit of something, and that resident learned a little bit of something about the officer. And that was key. And I tell you, it's one relationship at a time, one opportunity at a time. Now, you spoke about routine violations there. There's technical means of doing it. When, whenever an officer fills out a use of force uh, report, we know that. And after a certain number of filed in a certain period of time, it's called an early warning system, they come in various forms. Well, we have that to where once that happens, that triggers an audit. We then take a look at, okay, what's going on? We review videos, in-car videos. We look at reports. We talk to supervisors. That happens more routinely. And sometimes these things are well explained, and sometimes they're not. And when they're not, we're obligated to investigate. And we do. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Chief. And this is gonna be the last question for Chief Blocker, and then we're gonna to transition to a, a, another candidate after the Chief does a closing. Go ahead, sir. Thank you. Name is Wesley Watson. Thank you. Um, thank you for your service. Um, in the military and with the police force 
in Battle Creek. Um, I come from a background, my dad was a retired police officer and my brother is in law enforcement and my uncle's a retired police officer, so I understand. Um, my question is, here in the city, uh, we have problems when it comes to recruitment, recruiting um, police officers that reflects the community. Um, what will be your stance on recruiting police officers from the community, recruiting police officers that reflects the community, and also retaining those police officers as well? Um, how can we make sure we have uh, the right number of Latinx, Hispanic police officers, also the, the right number of African American police officers on the police force? Uh, time and time again, as we look at the new candidates that's coming out of the police academy, we're not seeing police officers that look like, look like me or reflects the community. So what will be your stance to, that will uh, increase the diversity when it comes to the police force and retaining uh, those officers as well? Thank you. Well, you just touched on one of the, the, the critical factor facing our profession today and nurses and teachers is we're not finding enough people. Um, we, we really have to start challenging ourselves um, with what traditions and, and what cultures will we have to compromise with in our past to try to gain the trust and the interest um, and in what bandwidth, how are we going to communicate with young people today to introduce them to law enforcement as a service above self? And you can't tell me there aren't folks of all varieties of communities and of all diverse communities um, and gender aren't interested in service above self. Matter of fact, uh, we know that the Gen Xers at 17 to 26, that is one of the driving factors. Maybe they want to have weekends off too, right? But one of the driving factors is that idea of service above self. So re-engineering uh, re our means to communicate to show them that policing is more than a pension, more than a uniform, more than a badge or a gun. It's actually about service, you know, and depth and to the community. Um, I think that's the approach. I think the approach that we've always taken in the past is we throw up a bunch of numbers, we show them what's our pay, and we try to be really competitive with pay, and those things are really important. But I think really if we start to focus in on why, the why behind you, you want to serve as a police officer and the rewards uh, behind serving as a police officer, I think we're going to get a lot more. Uh, and we're going to hit the right population. Now when it comes to to youth, I can tell you, or just recruiting in general, you know, we used to go over to the east side, expend a lot of um, energy and horsepower and go over to the east side of the state and recruit. Um, and, and that was successful from time to time. But what we found is eventually everyone on the, that we hired from the east side over here would eventually go back to the east side. Well, if you ask them, their biggest complaint was the same thing. Well, we come over here and cultivate new fields, and because it's a real knife fight right now, if you haven't noticed, in terms of hiring people, right? And uh, same thing. If, if you hired them into the east side of the state, ultimately they'd want to come back. Um, so we instituted about five years ago the Police Explorer Program, which was designed, it's a Boy Scout structured program, designed to cultivate, educate, and allow youth to sort of dip their toe into this idea of community service through law enforcement. And we have had just exceptional rewards because what we're able to do mm -hmm. is generate interest and cultivate our own, organic to the community. And eventually they're able to see, I, I can make, I can continue to serve above self, you know, humbly and honorably, and I can continue to, to raise my family. And, and everything about this community is a priority to me because it's my community. And the benefits have been, uh, have been rewarding. We've, I believe, hired eight out of that program of late. Thank you, Chief. All right. Could you take like one minute and do a, a quick closing if you think you need to? Yes, sir. Well, I'll just, I'll, I'll end the way I began. And I want to just thank you for the honor to be here. I want to thank you importantly for taking the time to be here because you value this process and obviously you value the community. And just as importantly, you value the police officers that serve. Um, this is an incredible community. Um, like I said, I've watched it grow. 
and you have an incredible department with some incredible officers that are just poised to take that next step. And um, it'd just be an honor to be a part of it. Thank you. Thank you, Chief. At this time, I'd like to invite uh, Commander Eric Winstrom to the podium. Oh, thank you. Commander Winstrom, would you introduce yourself to the Grand Rapids community and tell them why you want to be the next police chief? Uh, sure, absolutely. Um, no, my name is Eric Winstrom. Um, can I tell a little bit about my background too? Um, you know. Uh, um, not many of my long-term plans, as in most people's life, turn out exactly um, as they plan, especially not an 11-year-old's plan. But when I was uh, 11, I was living in Austin, Texas, and my uh, older brother, who was my hero, still is, by the way, uh, was arrested for a very small amount of uh, cocaine, and he was sent to prison for an unreasonable amount of time. The impact that that had on 11-year-old me stuck with me to the point that at 11 years old, I wanted to change policing. I wanted to eat, tear it down, replace it, whatever. I was so infuriated with what I saw was injustice, with how I saw it impact uh, my family and my, and my brother, who's a great young man. Um, and so um, as, I, as I went through life, I, I, uh, I went to law school and I studied administration. I mean, I, I went to uh, college, I studied administration of justice, and I was going to change the system. And uh, I went to law school. And while I was in law school, I befriended a few New York City Police Department officers who were lawyers at the same time. And they shared my mindset. And they said, Eric, if we're going to change policing, to get the credibility, we have to do it from the inside. I joined uh, the Chicago Police Academy a couple weeks after I graduated law school. I started in 2000. Um, I worked in um, on the south side of Chicago in some of the busiest neighborhoods. And um, yeah, in 2013, I got my first um, uh, my first really exciting assignment that was to take over our uh, our child sex crimes investigation team for the for the entire city. Extremely rewarding work. Um, the 25 men and women who work there are incredible. I moved on from that, and uh, I was actually uh, positioned to be an attorney for the police department. So um, I had kind of landed my dream job. I was able to, to advise on policy for the whole department. Um, as things changed in policing, essentially uh, a young man was murdered by a Chicago police officer a few years ago. and. Uh, I became the head of the first commanding officer of a unit called the Office of Reform Management, which is like my dream job. We're finally gonna, going to change things. And it was a, a unit that was specifically created to take the Chicago Police Department from this warrior culture and move it to a guardian culture, to take the best practices uh, across the country in use of force and accountability and put that in place. And so I got to see in real time and be a part of this just tremendous culture change in the police department uh, moving forward. It was such an honor. So looking back, 11-year-old me, it was exactly where I wanted to be. And uh, it felt so good to make that sort of change in Chicago. Uh, fast forward to February of, of uh, 2020. I was honored to open up a brand new detective area on the northwest side of the city where I work with what I would say are the 200 finest men and women in the Chicago Police Department seeking justice um, for victims across the city. It's uh, truly an honor to lead them. So why Grand Rapids for me? And um, you all know, and I can see it, it's, it's a testament to the, the community that you actually care, that you want to do, you want to do this right. You want to make sure that the Grand Rapids Police Department lands in the right place. Grand Rapids is vibrant, it's growing, it's diverse, it has the culture and, and uh, 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 the culture and amenities of the great city that it is. It's such an exciting time to be in Grand Rapids, and it's such an exciting time and pivotal time to be in police leadership. The opportunity to take over this department is an incredible one. You know, the vision for the Grand Rapids Police Department is to make Grand Rapids the safest mid-sized city in the country and to make the Grand Rapids Police Department the most trusted police department in the country. And I believe it. From the conversations I've had with everyone I've met today, uh, with the research I've done, this city is serious about getting policing right 
And for somebody in police leadership, this is something I want to be a part of. So it's just been a super honor to make it this far. I really appreciate it. It's been great to meet all the people I, I, I've interacted with. And uh, thanks for uh, coming out to hear us tonight. I appreciate it. Great, thank you. And I'm gonna ask you uh, one of the prepared questions that was sent in on the survey instrument. Um, there was an article written in the Chicago Sun-Times where it suggested that you were, quote, calling in favors when it came to a particular prosecution. First, can you briefly tell us why this case was even newsworthy and what you actually did and why you did it? Absolutely, and I, I remember the day that article, article came out and it kind of had a, a sinister uh, vibe to it, but far from it. So the incident was a, a little girl, a little seven-year-old girl named Serenity Broughton who was sitting with her six-year-old sister Aubrey in a car seat on a residential street in the city of Chicago in the middle of the day on a Sunday going out to ice cream. And uh, just an evil, evil man who had a veta, vendetta against her uncle opened fire with a fully automatic weapon and filled the car full of holes, killed the little seven-year-old girl, almost killed her, her little sister Aubrey, who's a, such a brave uh, girl. We've stayed connected with the family this whole time. And uh, my detectives and my supervisory staff worked round the clock. And this really hit us. Um, you know, uh, th there's this idea that police c can kind of take a step back and emotionally detach. When you're talking about the murder of a seven-year-old girl, I'm, I don't have the ability to do that. And I know, know the uh, men and women who work for me don't either. So we took this very personally and um, worked extremely hard, identified the offender, arrested the offender, presented it for charging, and the charges were rejected by the state's attorney's office. We've had disagreements before with the state's attorney's office, and uh, they pushed back, and the, the uh, detectives who were working on it asked me to review it fully. I read hundreds of pages, I watched hours of video, and the detectives were right, this case should have been charged. So I called in a favor, by calling over to the state's attorney's office and say, you got to review all the evidence that I reviewed. This guy is guilty. Now, the article came out, and uh, fast forward a few weeks, the uh, man was indicted. We arrested him hiding in a, a makeshift hideout underneath some stairs, and uh, he's in jail now awaiting trial. So, um, yeah, but uh, the sometimes kind of got it wrong. Thank you. Okay, so I'm going to ask you a, a question that came in on Facebook. Please advise, as the chief of police, how you would plan to address issues of civil unrest. GRPD previously tear gas protesters for not disbanding and arrested peaceful protesters. Also share how you would engage violent protesters. And there's a difference, um, clearly. When you're talking peaceful protesters, you're talking protesters. When you're talking violent protesters, then when we want to talk about tear gas and things like that, it might be necessary to, um, to ensure physical safety for people to use tear gas. When you're talking um, uh, peaceful protests, I know in Chicago I've supervised uh, as an attorney in the field, uh, First Amendment attorney for protest, I've supervised uh, dozens if not probably over 100 protests, and we've had an excellent track record um, of ensuring that everyone's voice can be heard. So much so that um, Chicago is a very liberal city to protest. Um, you can have a permit. If you don't have a permit, there's a very good chance we're still going to let you protest. Oftentimes, we'll shut down uh, streets to accommodate uh, protest groups that don't have uh, uh, permits and our whole goal is to ensure that everyone's voice can be heard when there's violence involved obviously there's a there's a difference I'm not passing judgment on the Grand Rapids response because I'm not familiar with it at all but uh, the time and place for tear gas is very limited great thank you thank you um, I would invite uh, a member of the community to the podium how you doing sir My name I'm is good Dr. how are you Jones I'm a member of this community. Uh, I'm actually from Chicago, so it's pretty funny to see one of the police chiefs might be from Chicago. But um, my cousin was killed by the state police in Illinois. 
And uh, I heard you talking about uh, somebody that got killed a couple years. His name was Darren Green Jr. I don't know if you heard about that. Um, but I also want to know, um, with internal affairs cases, uh, how do you uh, plan to manage those and make sure that if the police is actually in the wrong, that those people, officers get held accountable? Because there hasn't been a lot of accountability. I have a permanent scar right here on my eye, and I had went to internal affairs, and I know the police was in the wrong. Now, I'm not judging any police officer, because any time that I've ever had any problems, like my car had, one day I was, just for a little story, one day I was driving from... Uh, uh, um, a march and my tire had fell off and uh, it was a police officer that actually helped me put my tire back on my car so I'm always optimistic because I know there's good officers and I know there's bad officers so I just want to know how would you handle those uh, internal affair cases to actually make sure that those officers are accountable <coughs> that um, are in the wrong. Mr. Jones thanks and, and thanks for sharing that uh, personal story with us. Um, you know, one thing that I didn't mention that I do on a regular basis is we have a rotating uh, nighttime incident commander for the city. And part of my job as a rotating incident commander is to supervise um, police-involved shootings. So just anecdotally, over the past year, uh, I've supervised, I believe, eight police-involved shootings. Four of those shootings that I supervised resulted in the police officer being criminally charged. Now that's not, uh, that's not a positive for the Chicago Police Department, except that it's a positive that we are to the point now where we take accountability so serious that there is no cover up. We're moving to that. I know that Grand Rapids is um, in the process of getting right civilian accountability. In the city of Chicago, we have oversight with uh, several actually civilian accountability boards. And I know moving forward here, if I'm fortunate enough to move forward, that that's something that uh, you know, I'm going to have to sit down and we're going to have to work together to make sure that if you have concerns that there's a cover up or, you know, the police are looking out for each other. Um, you know, the police need legitimacy from you. And if that legitimacy comes from civilian oversight, then civilian oversight needs to happen. So thank you very much for the question. I'll skip the intro. Lucas Leverett came from Nashville seven months ago. Glad to be here. Thanks for putting up with my southern self. Mr. Winstrom, uh, I've, I've talked about the background and the resume reviews. Uh, like me, you come to Grand Rapids from an outside bigger city perspective. Also like me, you've probably been witness to the corruption, problematic baggage, and challenges of a big city. To those on the right, Chicago is a cesspool of failures. To those of us on the left, recent and current leadership have been ineffective and embarrassing to our causes. No matter your perspective, Chicago doesn't instill a lot of confidence. How would you characterize your proximity to well-publicized issues in the CPD, such as corruption, excessive use of force, as well as your personal views on those, such as the series of incorrect addresses rated with dubious no-knock warrant practices and the like? Now, the last part was my personal involvement? Yeah. Was that, okay. Well, fortunately, I haven't had any uh, pers personal involvement in, in, in such things. Um, yeah, Chicago does have uh, a history of corruption going back. I tell you, when I came on the police department in 2000 and I sat down with veteran officers, they would retell stories about the times um, when they were young officers and they would make a traffic stop and they'd walk up to the car and say, pardon me, sir, you're doing $10 over the speed limit. And they meant it sincerely. Uh, fortunately, times have changed and the culture has changed and the city of Chicago Police Department today is in a completely different place than it was even when I was hired. Um, as far as uh, the cesspool allegation of crime, Chicago has a lot of challenges. I'll give you just one anecdotal example of something that, that we work on. You know, there's a, there's a spike in uh, vehicular hijackings and carjackings. My detectives very recently arrested a juvenile for carjacking. It was his fourth carjacking arrest. Prior to that, he had four possession of stolen motor vehicle arrests. So this is his eighth felony arrest. And on that eight arrest, eighth arrest, his fourth time using a handgun to take a car from someone, that eighth arrest was the very first time that he was held in custody. Every other time he was returned to his family. So Chicago has a ton of challenges, not, not all of which can be worn by the Chicago Police Department. And I tell you, I'll, I will admit Chicago has a ton of challenges. What I bring to Grand Rapids is my experience for well over 20 years dealing with these incredible challenges in such a big uh, environment. I'm, not, I'm bringing the experiences with me. I'm not bringing any of the challenges with me. And I'll invite someone else to the microphone. 
Hi, my name is Matthew Smith, and my question is the following. How do you respond to calls to defund the police in a constructive way, that is, in a way that doesn't simply brush away the underlying frustrations and issues that have been expressed by the movement, particularly with respect to lack of funding for community resources, excessive use of force, and over-policing leading to unfavorable outcomes? That's a great question, Mr. Smith. I appreciate it very much. Yeah, um, and to be honest, I think probably, if we're being honest, every single person in this room would love to live in, um, in a world where we can defund the police and we don't need the police. Unfortunately, where we are today, that's not the case. So it's, can we take um, activities that, that police are doing and um, maybe they don't need to do and use those resources uh, for social services? For example, uh, mental health response. We recently in Chicago um, started a pilot program for co-responding model of, of mental health where you call 911 uh, for a mental health crisis and it's not just a police response that shows up it's a, a police officer team with a paramedic team with a clinician um, so ideas like that very open to any sort of uh, defund the police like i said in a in a perfect world that would be amazing but you and i both know that it would have to be done thoughtfully and have to see is there a reason that we're sending uh, um, uh, individual in uniform with a gun to this call for safety that sound that seems to be a police call is it a call that maybe somebody not armed um, can accomplish that's a th sort of things that I would look at to say you know we can reallocate resources for that sort of situation thank you thank you Thanks, uh, commander before the next uh, person comes up to the uh, the microphone I want to ask a question from Facebook uh, Commander, please tell us about any equity work that you've done in your previous roles and how do you plan to recruit and retain officers, specifically officers of color? When I was hired uh, by the Chicago Police Department, the Chicago Police Department was primarily filled with uh, police officers that looked like me. Um, I, I think I ran the numbers last week as of last week, um, male whites only account for about 31% of the police department. But recruiting in, and retaining officers is a real challenge uh, made uh, more difficult by the current uh, climate of policing. And um, so, you know, how you accomplish recruiting in this day and age, you have to take advantage uh, of all the opportunities. And I'm talking social media, um, um, for diversity, uh, we have a, a team in the Chicago Police Department that visits historically black colleges. And, uh, but really the trick is, what you want to do is you want to make the police department uh, a great place for everyone to work. Word travels quickly in the police community. If you've got uh, the reputation in Grand Rapids of that's a police department that embraces diversity, um, it pays a good living, and it treats officers well, you're not going to have the same challenges as elsewhere. So that's really the solution is making the department a great place to work for everyone. And, and that's it. Thank you. Uh, Ma'am. Hello. I am the uh, executive director of external outreach as well as on the executive committee with the NAACP. Um, it is our concern um, and our contention that the next police chief would have an extensive background in improving community and police relations. So our question to you would be if you can please give some examples of how you've been a successful part of effective community policing practices in communities of color. Absolutely. Thank you very much. And uh, I'll tell you again, going back to my young days on the police department when things were different, when I uh, came in from the street at the end of a shift, I would uh, check off with a supervisor and that supervisor would look to me and say, OK, Eric, what did you do today? And the measure, the metrics of success for a young police officer in two, 2000 was how many arrests did you make? How many citations did you did you write? How many cars did you tow? And I was working in the Robert Taylor Homes, which is a high rise project uh, on the south side of Chicago, uh, abject poverty. So if I write a $75 ticket to someone, that can seriously impact their life. And that, at the time, was, well, this is how you'd be a good police officer. And I was always kind of an outsider because it was like, no, I don't think so. You know, hey, I changed somebody's tire today. 
Um, I made a positive community interaction. I, uh, I made a, a positive interaction with a kid and you know, now he likes the police. Those are the things that, that I was striving for, but the metrics at the time were that. So um, you asked, for example, of, of what I've done aside from just my personal actions. When I was head of policy for the police department, we started a, a pilot program, which is now expanded to 11 district and the current superintendent has committed to expanding it to all 22 districts, a neighborhood policing initiative. And what it does is it takes beat officers and it reserves 30% of their time um, during that time, they're not responding to calls for service, they're not responding to 911 calls, but they do have a job. And that job is during that time of the day, they're going out and they're making contact. They're making contact with crime victims, they're making contact with business owners, they're following up on crime conditions. So they're, it's, they're not uh, you know, sitting in a stop sign w waiting to see if somebody kind of drifts through so they can pull them over. They're taking the initiative to make those positive, positive connections. And that's something I, I did have a hand in. Thank you. Thank you for the question. Next person. Thank you. Hi, uh, my name is Grace. I live in the third ward. Um, and my question for you is, um, you talk about your commitment in your letter uh, to never underserve uh, marginalized communities. And um, in Grand Rapids, there's this weird combination of uh, under policing and over patrolling in a lot of uh, low income neighborhoods and neighborhoods of color. Um, we're over patrolled day to day. Uh, a lot of people of color get harassed, but when we call 911, there is very slow response times, as a couple of other people have mentioned. So my question is to you: How will you work to address these contradictory characteristics of how the police are? What a great question! That is a great question. And so number one is being aware of it, and with community input from people like you, you know, the Chicago Police Department commits to regular community meetings, and we listen to the input. We follow up, we follow through. If you say something to me at this meeting, hey, this is what's going on in the community, I have to be there with an answer for you at the next meeting. It's very important. But uh, without that sort of input, that, that sort of thing, I know that the Grand Rapids Police Department collects that sort of data and it would be important to look at, looking at response time and looking, again, the metrics of success. You said that there's over-policing. If um, you know, you're calling 911 for a domestic violence incident, a, a victim of a robbery, and it takes 15 minutes for a squad car to arrive, but in the meantime, there's an officer outside making traffic stops all night, that's a big issue. And that's a, you know, if that's true, that's a, a leadership issue, and leadership starts at the top. And uh, um, yeah, so it's, that's definitely something that I would one of the first things that I would look into in the third ward. All right, thank you. Thank you for the question. Next person. Hi, thank you for coming tonight. My name thank is Mike you. Williams. I'm a longtime drug policy activist, uh, 39 years in Grand Rapids. Uh, I appreciate you sharing the story about your brother and you know how that set your eyes on the need for reform and policing. Um, and you also had talked a little bit about discretion of the police with the gentlemen uh, with the carjacking incidents. Kept, they made the discretion to take him home to his parents. Uh, when we talk about uh, problematic substance use, usually this is a mental health thing. It's not necessarily, you know, some malevolent intent going on with drug possession, drug usage. Um, how do you as a, if you were made police chief, how would you uh, create a more holistic response to address this from a public health standpoint rather than criminal justice? Yeah, that's a great question. And when I was in patrol, you know, I'd see the same individual being arrested over and over. And I'm like, where's, where's the positive impact that we're having on anyone? involved in this. Um, we in the, uh, the Chicago Police Department have what we call a narcotics diversion program where we'll get in um, not drug sellers um, because I will say that the sale of drugs does drive violence in the city of Chicago, but drug users, I mean, you catch somebody with a, with a gram of rock cocaine, that's not the drug kingpin that's driving violence in Chicago. That's somebody that's likely has a, a dependency issue. And so we've created a narcotics diversion program to um, to move those out of the criminal justice system and toward uh, um, drug counseling. So uh, looking at that, those sort of options here would definitely be important. You know, it's how are the police officers spending their time? If we're spending our time arresting low-level drug possessors, it's probably not the best use of a police officer's time, in my opinion. Okay, before we have the next person, I'm going to ask a question that was submitted uh, through the online survey. Um, 
Commander Winstrom, what strategies would you use to reduce gun violence in Grand Rapids? There's a lot. I mean, there's there's a lot there. So obviously, I don't currently live here. There's a lot of data available. I'm a, a big fan of evidence-based policing. Um, it works. There is evidence that uh, directed patrols uh, of areas. So, but it, it takes research. Um, human intelligence, if it's available, a lot of people like to talk to the police, and sometimes if you just ask, they'll tell you where the issues are, um, who the. Uh, who the subjects are that, that you should be looking at as driving uh, violence. One, another program that we have in Chicago is called uh, Custom Notifications, where you know everybody on the block knows that Eric Winstrom is the uh, the gang member who's who's driving the violence, and we will proactively go a police commander. Uh, social service providers, uh, others, and seek out loved ones, seek out that individual and sit with them and say, hey, your life is going down the wrong path. What can we do to, uh, to set you on the right path? Yeah. As far as gun violence um, altogether too, I know that this, this has been an issue uh, here that uh, you know, there's voices on, on the other side. We utilize ShotSpotter in the city of Chicago. And um, that I, I would suggest at some point in time that it's a discussion that should be had because when you're talking about you know people getting shot and people getting killed, uh, that value of that we've actually seen quite a bit in the city of Chicago because it is very good technology and it offers good data too to know that we might need to sit a police car in this area because there's a you know there's somebody shooting over there on a regular basis. So, yeah. right. Thanks. Thank you. I would invite you to uh, the uh, microphone. Hello, uh, Russell Olmstead, West Side, Grand Rapids. Um, I got, uh, I guess, a question about accountability uh, for building trust between police and, and community uh, here in Grand Rapids. Um, and it kind of comes back to the idea of internal affairs. Well, not even kind of, completely. Um, I'm wondering if more specifically you could go into uh, uh, some sort of explanation of your idea of a healthy functioning um, internal affairs unit, how it, how, uh, there are different philosophies and schools of thought about whether or not it is something that uh, can be done within a police force or should be investigated outside of the individual police force. Um, and I'm wondering what your thoughts are on that and what your, if you were to get the job under your leadership, what your direction would be for an internal affairs unit. Sure. Well, first, I'll answer the last question first, and that's transparency. It has to be transparent, internal and, and external. Okay, no police officer should be surprised that they get suspended or fired for some action. It's got to be clear what's expected of them, what and uh, what won't be tolerated. External transparency: when you make a complaint, you need to know what happened to that complaint, and you need to know why. Um, as far as the actual best type of accountability system, whether it's all internal, external, I know there's different ideas on that, but you know what? The people that sit in these uh, these seats here. They're the ones that listen to you, listen to the community, that empower the police to do what they do. And uh, I believe that they've, they've determined that there's a civilian police accountability system. So the legitimacy that the police get is from the community. If the community decides that there needs to be a civilian accountability system, there needs to be a civilian accountability system. So it's not, you know, what does the chief of police um, think? It's then it turns into how does the chief of police work with that civilian accountability system and make it the best system possible? I do have a, a quite a bit of experience that we have three distinct civilian accountability systems in Chicago, another one coming online soon. So I, I've seen quite a bit of it and uh, I would have a, 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 you know, many great discussions with the leader of this one here. All right. Thank you. Thanks for the question. Hi, my name is Jason Fulton, and I'm a member of Chief Payne's Advisory Committee. In 2020, the Homeless Outreach Team was created in Grand Rapids. It was groundbreaking. Today, that team is a collaboration of both the Grand Rapids Police, Fire Departments, as well as social workers and addiction recovery specialists from Network 180. This team creates a unique opportunity for the unsheltered to build relationships with first responders, mental health professionals, as well as giving those in dangerous situations officers they can trust because of those relationships. If you become the chief of police, how are some ways you would build on the success of that team, as well as metrics you'd look to measure against them? Well, that's great. Well, as far as metrics, you know, it's not illegal to be unhoused. 
let's face it. But the interaction with um, people living in homelessness and police is statistically higher than people living in houses. That's just, just a fact. So the metrics would be how often are we, are we getting called to these areas? Um, how often are people who are unhoused victims of crime? So those sort of things. As far as building on that success, that sounds like a fantastic program. We have similar program. We have uh, homeless outreach officers in, in Chicago uh, that do similar things. We have quite a few tent camps there. Um, I, I would be really interested to hear more about that and hear if it needs more resources or uh, you know what's working and what's not working. But it sounds like an ex excellent program. Thank you. Thanks. Great. Ma'am. Hello, my name is Lynn. Hi. And I've been a resident of Grand Rapids for, I won't say how long, they'll kill my age, but <laughs> long time. <laughs> High school, um, grade school, everything. There is a serious problem with diversity, racial divide in the city. Let's not hide it. Let's put it out there. What do you plan to do as far as effectively dealing with the youth, the minority youth in the third ward, how do you plan to, I mean, work with them instead of always arrest and conquer? How do you plan to work with them? Wow. Yeah, that's a great question. So there's tons of youth programs available. Um, I know it's not all about programs, but um, seeing a police officer in a, a non-enforcement situation in a program, in uh, an athletic program, um, a uh, youth police academy, uh, coffee with a cop, chess with a cop, seeing a police officer in a non-enforcement situation is good not only for the youth to meet with the police officer and say, hey, this is a human being, but it's great for the police too. And uh, you know, those sort of connections at that young age, and I, I don't know if there's a high school program here, you know, we have a, a a high school program in Chicago that Chicago public school students can uh, go through kind of a, a Chicago police academy and get credits for it. They, they also create sort of a pipeline to the future of the police department when they make those connections and say, I want, I want this guy's job over here. And five or six years down the road, now we have a, a, a great brand new Grand Rapids police officer. So there's a lot of opportunities there and it's taking them. I know in the time of uh, pandemic time, it's been a struggle for us, I'm sure, for, for uh, the Grand Rapids Police Department as well. So it's challenges. Hopefully that will uh, subside and those sort of challenges will diminish. Okay. Every, I guess every child does not want to be a police officer, especially looking at what has transpired over the last what? several years. I'm sorry. <laughs> but, but it's true. They do not. But, and, and a lot of it has to do with what they have seen. Absolutely. And stuff and what they've encountered or had to encounter or a relative of theirs had to encounter. So what would be your, I guess you kind of answered that, but what would be yeah. your um, but, like a solution? Yeah, but, and, and I'm with you. And I wish I had all the answers because that's a great question. You know, our slogan in Chicago, but I, I mean, back to my own personal story. I, I was like, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to change this. You want to change it? Okay, be the change. You know, we... Yeah. Come on, that's our slogan for recruiting in the Chicago Police Department, be the change. You see something you want to change? Come on, it's your turn. It's your turn. So, yeah, I don't have all the, all the solutions, but uh, I am very much aware of that issue. All right. Thank you. I'm looking for them. Thank you. Chief, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, uh, Commander uh, Winstrom, I'm going to ask you a question from, that just came in on Facebook. Um, <coughs> Are, are police officers who violate Miranda rights going to be held accountable if you were appointed the chief of police? And if so, uh, how would you reprimand them? Wow, that's a uh, okay, interesting question. Uh, and uh, legally speaking, uh, if they're violating Miranda rights and, and it's a viola violation of, uh, you know, their actual, I don't want to get too lawyerly on you. In custody if it's, <laughs> yeah, so without getting too lawyerly, if it's, a, if it's an actual violation that harms someone, of course they should be held accountable. Absolutely. Absolutely. We don't, uh, you know, in 2022, you don't see the Constitution as an impediment to your job. That's the framework for how you do your, do your job. You know, there's plenty of um, 
examples of authoritarian governments across the country that have very little crime and very few civil rights. Like, that's not us, that's not America. So absolutely, um, when policing is done, it needs to be done constitutionally. Great, thank you. Thank you. Sir? Hello, my name is Richard Schneider. I'm the executive director of a security company in Grand Rapids. Um, many my guards have to work with police while not being police. And my question is, how do you plan, if elected chief, to strengthen the communication and teamwork between security guards and professional law enforcement? Absolutely. That's a great question because there's so many more in the private field in security, and um, it's all about teamwork. You know, we have had a rash lately in my own area of uh, organized retail theft, and we couldn't solve those crimes and we couldn't stop them if we didn't uh, collaborate with the, uh, the the big security companies, the uh, one security guard at the store, um, et cetera. It's really collaboration. It's getting together. We hold meetings with, uh, you know, we, we have a long-standing relationship with Alta Beauty. Um, we'll sit down with them. We'll, we'll have meetings. So it's getting together, talking about our common problems, how we can help you, and then, you know, what you could do to have a positive impact as well, too. But, yeah, we value our relationship with private security in Chicago very much. So thank you. Thank you. And we have time for one, maybe two more questions. Good evening. My name is Kelsey Perdue. I'm a resident of Grand Rapids. Good evening. Good evening. So my question, um, unfortunately, de the department and the community often feel at odds, this sort of us-then dynamic. And I believe that for a true reform to happen in the best interest of everyone, the new chief will need to keep officer morale high that will support reform within the department and have the support and the engagement of the community. So I would love to hear more about how you will balance building trust, accountability, and leadership with both of these really important Ooh, groups. That is an in-depth question. Okay. <laughs> well, let me put it this way, the community, um, the, the at odds thing. So um, if you want a failed police department, you have an us against them mentality. Because essentially what you have them is you have an occupying army. And uh, that's an absolute failure of a system to have. So how you um, successfully make bridges, so if, if we're really in a, in a place where it's, there's that much divide, it's gonna take a lot of time and a lot of communication. And it's communicating with the police officers, hey, this is what the community sees. Uh, when I gave direction to, uh, to people that work for me, it's this is what we're doing, and this is why we're doing it. And that usually takes away all resistance. Um, I, I like to think that I lead in a, in a humble manner and that I, I'm approachable, um, especially with young police officers. I have, everything's a question. Why do we do this? Why do we do this? I love it when the police officers come to me and say, hey, why are we doing this? I don't think this is right. And if the answer is because this is what the community wants, this is what's going to build bridges with the community, then in the long run, that's going to make their job tremendously easier. I mean, we all, just about everyone in the policing profession, lived through this period of time after May of 2020 where we all felt like the enemy, where, you know, it, my neighbors were literally wash, walking past my house with protest signs against the police department. I'm like, but our kids go to school. I thought we were friends, you know, so no one wants that. Um, we want to be in a situation where the community and the police absolutely on the same page and we're co-producing public safety together. It can't be an us against them, it's got to be us all together. Absolutely, thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. And this will be the last question. Yes, my name is Kent County Commissioner Robert S. Womack from 4907 here in Grand Rapids, Michigan. Two short questions, thank you for letting get me get my comments in. Um, when we were growing up, we knew the police. It wasn't always if you saw someone in a uniform, you say, hey, there goes the police. It'd be like, where well, there goes Ralph. There's um, Maurice. Yeah. Uh, there's Andrew Rusticus. And, um, you know, we um, definitely send our uh, condolences out to the Rusticus family. He's an officer that did um, die during some training for the K-9 unit. Um, what are some of the things you would do to help bring up police morale, but also for the police to also get to know the community on a more personal level, especially Absolutely. in the communities that they are policing. And yeah. not only us know them by name, but them know our children by name. Yeah. And some of the interactions with our youth, 
have been caused by the police not knowing who the youth are and them not knowing who the police are be it beyond the badge. Thanks, Commissioner. I, I appreciate that. Yeah, and I think that those, the, uh, they kind of go uh, hand in hand, and it's making sure that the police officers are empowered and they know they're empowered, that they don't have to sit on that, that stop sign, they don't have to run radar. They don't, if there's, you know, it's a two-part test is how that police officer spending their time having the most positive impact on the community and is what they're doing, what they think they're doing, is it embraced by the community? And if you're meeting those two things, and in the scenario you describe, oftentimes the best use of a police officer's time is gonna be making those connections with the kids in the neighborhood. Um, and that is fantastic for morale. I love interacting with kids on the street when the kids are like, hey police, how you doing? I'm like, that's, that's a great day for us. Um, so I think they really go together. And so the, the solution really is making sure the officers are empowered to do those things and making sure they know they're empowered. You know, hey, I don't care if you write zero tickets today. I want you to have a, as positive impact as you can have on the community. Thank you. If you are hired, appointed to this position, as I've heard one of the chiefs talk about ride-alongs with the police for the community to get to know more about what the police do and how they view their job, would you be willing as a chief to do a walk along with me through the community without your uniform, without our suit and tie, t-shirts, baseball hats if you want to, if it's cold. Um, Every week. Sneakers. As, as often as you want. And just walk along through the neighborhood and um, interact that, at the barber shops, interact with Cure Violence when they're playing basketball with the youth at a Boys and Girls Center. And, uh, just introducing you on a first name um, level. Absolutely. Thank you. Thanks. Okay, uh, Commander Winstrom, would you take uh, a minute to wrap it up? Okay. I, just, and I, I spoke before and I couldn't get in this We're, so we're out of time. They're going to be faced with a big challenge. They're not going to have enough funding. The commissioners don't stand. They're going to be faced with a big challenge in funding. Sorry. Thanks. Cool. Gotcha. Un understood. And uh, so for my last minute, 45 seconds, whatever, I'll just say thank you to you and thank you to, to everybody else who's like-minded who took their time out of their nights to be here. And again, it shows that uh, it, it seems to me, it's very obvious that the city of Grand Rapids wants to get this right. Um, and so it's an honor to, to have made it this far. I appreciate you. Thanks, Gary. Thanks. Mr. Jackson, welcome. Thank you. I would like to invite you to introduce yourself to the Grand Rapids community and tell them why you want to be the next police chief here. Thank you. Hello, everyone. Um, Mr. Peterson, Mr. Washington, uh, thank you for having me. Thank you for advancing me to this position. Uh, it is truly an honor to be here. Before I start off with my introduction, I'd first like to um, address the topic that's been in the news for, for quite a bit. On November 1st, 1997, as a police officer, myself and my partner conducted a traffic stop. During the traffic stop, a young man jumped from the car and began to run. I followed and initiated a foot pursuit. During the foot pursuit, the young man showed signs to me that he was possibly armed with a firearm. He continually grabbed at his waistband. He turned and looked at me several times during the foot pursuit. So at a certain point, I drew my weapon, asked him to, gave him instructions to um, surrender. And as I closed the distance, he suddenly turned. He turned on me, he grabbed my arm, he grabbed my firearm. And the momentum of that situation, we both fell to the ground. And it was at that, that point when we were done discharged and the shooting took place. One of the worst 
days, one of the worst experiences that I've ever been through. It's important to note that the district attorney's office, along with the police department internal affairs division, conducted a full-scale investigation, and they both arrived at the same conclusion, that there was no wrongdoing on my part. Extremely, extremely terrible incident that occurred. Men and women joined the police department to save lives, to help people, to get involved with the community, solve community problems. That was my focus. Unfortunately, the shooting happened. And it's something that I think about and it's with me, has been for the last 24 years. I didn't want to open with that, but again, I thought it was important to share that information um, and be prepared for any questions that may come forward. A little bit of background about myself. I was born in a suburb of Chicago, but raised in Milwaukee. I'm the oldest of four siblings. They do call me Big Brother. And uh, I have three children. We, uh, we were raised in one of the challenging neighborhoods of Milwaukee. Um, but although challenging neighborhood, we had a very loving house. My mother was a single parent, had to bring in my grandmother, who was also a single parent, uh, to live with us and make the best of our situation. So it was from that experience that my, found, my foundation of helping people and doing the right thing was rooted. My policing career began in 1992. I was a young officer, again, wanted to make an impact, uh, save the world, if you will, right? And things progressed, and it was a number of uh, great assignments that I had, great opportunities to meet and collaborate with folks throughout the entire city of Milwaukee. Along the way, I received several promotions, and they were extremely impactful to my career. The first one was a promotion to a sergeant. The second was a promotion to a captain, and then the third promotion to an inspector. So after about eight years as a police officer, I received the first promotion. Very honored to receive the promotion. And it was a significant impact on my career. The reason is because I'm sure many of you know that the sergeant on a police department is the first line of supervision. It is that sergeant that's going to recognize when problems start to uh, evolve with officers um, or in communities um, or in the district station. So I had that responsibility. I also had the responsibility of maintaining um, code of conduct with police officers, um, training, working with them, embracing them to help nurture their careers as well. So after about eight years as um, a sergeant, I was then promoted to a captain. Again, very impactful uh, position for my career. Excuse me, just to back up. After about eight years as a sergeant, I was promoted to lieutenant first and then to a captain. So again, very impactful for my career. Um, I now had the responsibility of an entire area and a number of officers uh, to, again, help teach, coach, motivate, um, all towards our code of conduct and basically serving people in the community. We put together a number of great programs while I was a commander at District 7, and my entire focus, laser-like focus, was community outreach, community effort, and we were successful. Together, my staff, myself, we created programs such as the trauma-informed care, the Adopt-a-Block strategy. We had the Salvation Army, Milwaukee Police Department chaplaincy program. We had a very robust, very impactful faith-based initiative that included faiths, religions, denominations from across the board. And finally, we had a trauma-informed care initiative, again, Understanding that families and children go through pain, uh, we developed an initiative to uh, provide counseling uh, for those families and for those 
young people specifically. So after about a few years as a captain, I was then promoted to inspector. Again, very impactful because I now had the ability to oversee and work with the administration division for the entire agency. And if you can imagine, um, it's just like any other organization, there's a list of very important administrative functions like HR, like training, like internal affairs, um, budgeting, all important. I was a part of every aspect um, of, those, of those areas. And then after a short time in that role, I also um, was transferred and was able to work on the patrol division. Approximately 1,400 officers um, were under my oversight, um, spread out across the seven districts. So it's been a phenomenal career. Um, things went really well. But during the 26 years, there were a number of great strategies, a number of great operations, a number of great collaborations. But unfortunately, there was some painful incidents as well. Painful incidents that were really tough to deal with. The first was my officer-involved shooting. The second was losing a friend in the line of duty who was shot and killed doing a foot pursuit as well. Very difficult to deal with. The other incidents that were extremely terrible were losing friends, coworkers, individuals that were in the police academy with me to suicide. Officer related suicide is a significant issue um, across the country and we experienced it um, in our agency as well. So, I share those terrible experiences with you because they, similar to being promoted to a sergeant, just like being promoted to a captain and certainly like being promoted to an inspector, all have taken part to shape and mold who I am today. They have all impacted. The very bad and the very good have all impacted my leadership style. And those are the reasons that I think I'm well qualified to be the next police chief in Grand Rapids. Thank you. And Mr. Jackson, I'm gonna, just for uniformity, I'm going to refer to you as in, Inspector Jackson, even though you're retired. All right. <laughs> so Inspector Jackson, um, what strategies have you used in your department to build better bonds with the community? There are a number of strategies that uh, we used in the Milwaukee Police Department. I uh, mentioned several of them, but the no most notable strategy um, was the um, chaplaincy program. If I can elaborate on that just a little bit, the chaplaincy program um, was designed uh, to introduce um, pastors, ministers, faith-based um, organizations to families that have experienced a traumatic incident. The program was created um, on the heels of a very terrible shooting in the city of Milwaukee uh, where a young girl, a five-year-old girl, was sitting on her grandfather's lap and the house was shot up, she was shot and killed. Terrible incident. But from that, we realized that we needed to do more for the family. We being the police department and the investigators needed to do more from the family. So we took an already existing faith-based organization within District 7 and just started asking simple questions. One, what else can we do for the family? What else can we do for the community during these terrible incidents? We had a representative from the Salvation Army and we asked the same questions and together we came up with this strategy. Extremely impactful um, for the families that were involved and the operation is still uh, ongoing today. Great. Thank you. And now I'm going to ask a question uh, that was posed on Facebook. Um, Inspector Jackson, how do you stand on the mental health of r residents of Grand Rapids? Are you for a partnership with mental health services? Absolutely. 
there is no doubt, no doubt that, um, that mental health, those that are in mental health crisis at times, um, need something other than being arrested. In Milwaukee, um, some experience that I have is working with CIT officers. If you're not familiar with that, it's crisis, crisis intervention officers. Working with them to provide an alternative for officers um, that caught upon or happens upon a, a person uh, who may be struggling from a mental health episode to introduce them into the situation to de-escalate the situation. That's the goal, de-escalate, back off. There's nothing wrong with officers taking a step back to reevaluate the situation, um, ensure that we can have a successful uh, resolution, successful being um, helping the person out without causing the injury, without using force. So that was, that was one of the examples. Thank you. I'll invite uh, one of the uh, community members to the podium. How you doing, sir? My name is DeAndre Jones. Nice to nice to hear you from Chicago. From Chicago, too. I also wanted to say it had to have been crazy to be a police officer in Milwaukee when they actually won the championship last year. <laughs> but uh, I wanted to say, <clears throat> so um, you talked about uh, your incident with your gun discharging. My cousin actually died um, from a police officer, and he got into a scuffle with a police officer where his gun ended up discharging. Well, I don't really know. But that's what the officer said, and so um, just from a person who is uh, an African American uh, man who uh, lost a family member to a police officer, um, don't don't beat yourself up about that, man. Um, I, I know it's probably tough to deal with, but just don't beat yourself up about that. Um, also, uh, being here in the city of DR, you're probably going to have, if you are the uh, police chief, there is a lot of. Um, You'll probably be a police chief of a department that has more Caucasian officers than black officers or any of ethnicity. So, um, as a as a without um, putting race or anything in the uh, equation, how would you hold every officer to an equitable? How does an equitable police officer look to you without putting ethnicity into it? Thank you, thank you for your questions, and I'll start with uh, offering condolences and uh, uh, for, for losing your family member as well. It's always tough, right? It's always tough. No matter what the circumstances are, no matter who's involved, when there's that type of a situation, officer-involved shooting or any other type of shooting, a parent, a relative, a loved one has lost someone. So thank you for sharing that and thank you for the kind words as well. Equitable um, treatment within the, within the agency uh, is something that, that I will strive for and um, have no concerns that I will achieve. Um, the racial makeup of the agency, it is what it is. I think the important thing to note is that we have an agency where police officers care about the people that they're serving, right? So just through interactions and ongoing dialogue and conversations with all of the officers across the board, I'll get a sense of their willingness, their ability to go out into all communities. So the African-American community, um, the Spanish community, and any other community that is here in Grand Rapids, make sure that they're able to serve people on the same level, right? Another part that I'll touch on that's, that's important to note is uh, building the officer's trust and respect. For me, sure, it might be a little bit of a challenge because of being an outsider, but one of the things that officers really look for is to be treated fair. And so from my perspective, whether it's evaluating discipline, whether it's transferring to special operations or special assignments, the entire evaluation will be done fair and equitable. And I think that would be a great first step towards building um, a strong relationship internally and gaining their trust. Thank you. Good afternoon, well, good evening. My name is Wesley Watson. I want to thank you for your years, years of service. Thank you. Uh, as a police officer. Uh, my question is, um, back in 2015, the city of Grand Rapids was on the list as one of the worst places for African Americans to live. 
Uh, on that list, Grand Rapids ranked fifth, and on that list, Milwaukee ranked first. Um, I want to talk about, uh, at least for you to expand on, the aspect of what um, the different social determinants of, of health issues that's, that's dealing with within the black community and also within Milwaukee, understanding that study as as being one of the worst places for African Americans to live, how did you understanding being on the force at that time um, uh, deal with that issue and how did you work with community and work with the African American community to kind of bridge that gap and make it a place where everybody can live? And how can you bring that to Grand Rapids? Thank you. That's a great question. A lot to unpack, but it's a great question. Um, I'll jump right in with, uh, with, as you put it, the worst place to live. Um, so I'm not familiar with the Grand Rapids study that you indicated, but I have heard that and read several reports about that, uh, that in Milwaukee. And um, it's tough in many neighborhoods. There are many challenging neighborhoods in Milwaukee, but there is a tremendous amount of success in Milwaukee as well for African American and for minorities across the board. There are some challenges that the city faces and elected officials and those in city government along with the police department and fire and other city services, education, all need to come together and continue to work towards those challenges, right? Personally, um, I witnessed firsthand friends uh, going through high school that didn't finish. Um, they're doing good now. They're able to kind of rebalance, um, finish up their education and get things moving in the right direction. But it was a challenge. It was a challenge. So how that relates to policing and my experience uh, from that standpoint, again, I addressed it with the gentleman that you're seated next to. It's about equitable and fair policing across the board, across the board. So in District 7, uh, we had a unique structure in our police district because there was a certain area within the district that faced a number of challenges in their neighborhoods. And again, as a side note, we were very successful in building community relations in those areas. Um, establishing block watches in those areas and working with the community in those areas to develop crime reduction strategies. So it wasn't always about the police department coming up with crime reduction strategies. We involved the community as well. But also in District 7 and other parts, there were affluent areas that were very well. And so my message always to the officers and continue, will continue to be here in Grand Rapids is whatever area you're policing, whatever, whoever you're interacting with, make sure it's professional, make sure it's fair, and just treat everybody like that golden rule, right? Treat everyone how you would want to be treated. Amen. Did I get all of them? I think you had several points in there, okay. Thank you. You're welcome. Okay. Invite you to the podium, sir. You... All right, last time, Lucas Leverett, new loudmouth kid in town. Uh, this was originally supposed to be a panel question. I didn't know you'd be individual, so I would have knocked it all out at once. Mr. Jackson, thank you very much for being here. In this lineup of candidates, you bring the unique perspective of a black man who grew up in America. That may indeed be crucial to the repair of the policing profession and its relationship with the people. However, you're also unique among these candidates as being someone with an MBA rather than a law degree. And you have both public and private sector experience in the safety profession. Your recent pro sports security role could be seen as a big advantage in a city that prides itself on events, boasts a large alcohol consumption zone, and is a growing destination for tourism. On balance, MBA programs are typically designed to focus on a very different set of metrics and goals than what might be thought of as a tra traditionally beneficial uh, set of skills for public administration, especially in a sensitive role like the chief. How does a business-focused background in your education equip you to properly lead in an end-user, customer-focused, rather than owner-focused job like public service? Great question. Thank you. Um, 
I thought it was only PhDs that had to be defended, right? <laughs> I know a lot of college degree snobs. I'm a proud dropout, so I'm not judging. I'm trying to defend you, my I'm very proud um, and very honored to have gone through that Marquette University MBA program. And uh, the rigors of the study, um, the preparedness, for leadership roles in any organization is the backbone of that degree at Marquette. And that's exactly what I took from it. So um, I would argue that an MBA teaches you budgeting and the administrative function of an agency. So let me back up to say that when we look at a police department or an outside business, uh, whether it's in security or anything else, um, there are similarities, right? There are similarities with the HR function, with budgeting, um, with projecting costs, and just there's just a number of overlapping um, things. And so the MBA is not, not foreign. It's not um, so far out of touch that those concepts cannot be applied in law enforcement. And here's the other part of my answer. It's about serving people. Amen. It's about serving people. So MBA, law degree, science degree, it doesn't make a difference. If you're willing to put on a uniform, work with the person that's having a problem, listen to them, come up with solutions together, just about any degree is applicable. Thank and another, you. You said the pro sports. It seems like a strength potentially for an event-focused city like this. Well, uh, again, um, the uh, security nature um, and the uh, um, identifying um, some of the takeaways from that certainly are applicable to um, not only sports but just events. And so, you're absolutely right. As a matter of fact how to police events um, that are in the city is, uh, is something that certainly a chief needs to understand and be prepared to deal with. It is extremely unfortunate that we live in a society where um, mass casualties happen, right? Um, and so what we need to do and what I will do as the police chief is to ensure um, that we connect with venues, that we have connect with organizations to ask and be available to help them put together a safety and security plan. So if it's any organization or any venue, again, that, that hosts concerts or performances of any type, I would work with that local security department to make sure that they have a good operational plan. In the event something happens, the response is already planned out. We know what to do. We know who's going to do what. And hopefully that will minimize any further problems. And then one other point, and then I'll let the gentleman um, ask his question, is the security function in a business environment in any one of the organizations downtown, and I'll expand that to say any one of the hospitals downtown, any one of the universities that are, that is here, um, that are here within the city, all need to have a continuing uh, continuous of operation uh, plan and protocol. So safety and security, evacuation of fans is one part, but then how does that organization, organization continue operations down the road is another part. And so part of the MBA, part of my personal experience can bring that together as well. Mr. Brand. Thank you. Please take a question. I sure will. First of all, I'm so sorry about the victim, the victim's family when that happened, and you as well, sir. Uh, you lost a part of yourself. And you know what? PTSD is real. There was more suicides in, in policing than, and, and, than deaths by, you know. Absolutely right. I mean, it's terrible. I mean, the whole narrative is not good. But I'm from Voice for the Badge, a group I started. We stand with our police proudly. But whenever I do that, it seems like people are like, uh, well, you're no good because we support police. 
We support police, but I support the community too. I, th I could probably help more with the inner city relations and getting the funds to them that they deserve to have. I work with Robert S., Elijah Libet, you should meet these gentlemen, uh, Pat Phillips, wonderful people, Tyrone Bynum. We want to build unity in the inner city. That's our mission. My question is, is your short officers right now, very short, they, I don't even know if they have the best technology they should have. I don't know who even researches. I got a bolo wrap out there now that's supposed to be better for the safety of the citizen and better for the safety of the officer. It just wraps them up instead of a taser even. I guess my question is, is you're going to have to battle the city, your employers, because currently they do not show the support as a whole that they need to for our police to have the adequate amount of officers to do the job, to do the community engagement, which is so valuable, they don't have time. We need more officers, and you're going to be battling your own employers. So if you're up to that, I'm with you. Chief Haggerty, 20-year police chief here. Look him up. He was a good man. Now we're going through him every week. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> um, so um, to, to address your, your question and, and, and concerns, um, I understand that uh, um, through the evolution of staffing, um, departments, staffing models ebb and flow. Um, I certainly will work with the other department heads, uh, the city manager, Mark Washington, and whoever else needs to be at the table to uh, put together our strategic plan regarding staffing. And honestly, sir, um, I don't know, I don't anticipate it to be a battle um, I see city operations is one unit moving to serve the citizens of Grand Rapids, right? So that would be my focus. Evaluate the staffing model, make changes where uh, they need to be, um, and if there are shortages that need to be addressed, work with the other city partners to, to get them addressed. And there is shortage. And that, and there is in relationship to the FBI statistic of metric that states uh, one police officer for 1,000 residents, the national average is about two and a half, we're currently at one and a half. So we're half, about half staff. Next person, question? We're also well over the legal minimum of the budget, in case anybody cares, so. At 32%, that point, not really should be fine. If we could have order. <laughs> um, go ahead with your question, sir. Reverend Doug Van Dorn, live in the third ward. Um, Inspector Jackson, given that any predominantly white institution is infected with racism and that racism is, is a white problem that needs to be owned by, by white folks, um, how do you, as a black person, how will you avoid carrying the weight of dealing with that for a predominantly white power structure? And secondly, how will you use your position as chief and particularly your experience as a black man as an asset um, in helping the community combat racism in the GRPD? Thank you, and that's, that's an extremely important question as well. Um, I'll address the first part by stepping outside of the, the role of uh, law enforcement um, and, and look towards health care, right? And so the example that I'd like to just highlight a little bit is that when a person goes to the hospital, regardless of their race, I don't think the first question that they ask is, who's treating me, right? They embrace the doctor that's, or the nurse that's there to help them. So that example I'd like to use within the police department, when calls for service take place, our citizens, Grand Rapids citizens, need to know that the officer that shows up, regardless of race, will serve their needs, will help solve their problems. From the leadership perspective, how will I work with those of a different background? Easily, easily, not a problem. The first step in doing so, sitting down and talking with officers. I talked to this officer on the elevator earlier today, and this officer as well. Quick conversation, but that's something that would be expanded across the board. And sure, we can never, in law enforcement, we can never forget about race because it is so impactful in our, in our communities. But rest assured, um, I would have no problem leading the men and women 
of Grand Rapids Police Department, regardless of background. I'm sorry. I wanted, I wanted to clarify a little bit. As a, <clears throat> but as a black man in the in the city, it's easy for us to think that well, we have a black police chief, so we we have dealt with our dealing with racism in the in the police department, and it's easy for the you know economic white power structure, particularly, to let you carry the the load for dealing with all of that. So. So I mean I think that's that's a dilemma for a person of color in in a position like this. But also what it's not I I certainly know that you would be able to work across the board. But how how is you your life experience as a black person um, inform how you police and how is it an asset for understanding what needs to be put together in the community to to help deal with that with with racism in the DRPD. Yeah, thank you for the clarification on that. Um, yeah, my experiences, um, my upbringing in a certain neighborhood um, really allows me to understand some of the challenges that certain neighborhoods and certain people face, right? Um, I lived it to a, to a degree, so I understand it a little better. And with that understanding, it is my responsibility to ensure that my officers understand it as well. And so, it doesn't mean, you know, training specifically for a certain neighborhood. Got to go back to it means training officers across the board to treat people very well. Now, when you um, go into certain neighborhoods or you have certain interactions, maybe like with mental health we explained earlier, sure, there are certain understandings that you may need to know. And maybe from that, we take another step back to de-escalate situations. And that should always be uh, front of mind for officers that are responding to situations. Um, we advance, we move towards the gunfire. But at a certain point, once we're there, we need to take a strong evaluation to figure out what the next step is and if de-escalation is the best step in that process. So I hear what you're saying. Um, it's a great question, it's a great perspective. One that I will never forget, never overlook because of the deep history with our minority communities and law enforcement. So I'll never forget it. Um, but again, rest assured that I will address it through training, ongoing communication with the officers, and receiving feedback from the community. So let me touch on that for a second. I would need the help from all of you to give me the feedback, to give my officers the feedback on what we're doing right, and where we need to make improvements. So it's not a one directional leadership model. It's a servant leadership model. And what that means is we will come to you. We expect to hear from you. We expect to collaborate with all of you. And when we fall short, we will hold ourselves accountable and we will make corrections to move the operations forward. Thank you. We have time for about two or three more questions. Next person. Hi, uh, my name is Grace. I'm from the third ward. Um, Hello. So, I'm sorry? Hello. Oh, hi. <laughs> um, so my question for you is, so um, in 2019, you retired um, and became the security advisor for the MBA. So um, I'm curious kind of what led you to that career choice. And then respectfully, um, how can you convince us that you're coming back to Green Rapids for more than just a paycheck? Good question. Um, so as I progressed through my career um, and received my education, um, I'd always had a business model, business mindset. Um, and at the time when the opportunity um, came forward, I wanted to, uh, I wanted to experience it. Um, that's the short answer, I wanted to experience it. Phenomenal organization, phenomenal experiences um, over the last few years. But I gotta tell you, um, that passion is still burning in me. The passion to help solve community problems, to get into neighborhoods and work with people to improve their lives. So, so and that's why I'm coming back. Did I, I think there was a second part of your question. Yeah, um, so I'm just curious what made you um, 
come back and how can you convince us that it's for more than just a paycheck? Um, well, um, I think we all know that, uh, that, that in certain situations, uh, police officers and administrators don't always make um, as much money in comparable um, organizations. So it's not about the money. I think I've expressed that on several occasions. It's about building um, that community bond, strengthening in areas that need to be strengthened. All right, thank you for your time. Mm -hmm. We have time for two more questions. Hello. Hi. So I'm Kent County Commissioner Robert S. Womack, and very proud to work with uh, Johnny Brand, some of the voices of the badge and the things that come to community, helping us with the balance of understanding we got to support the police department, and we already know very well we have to support our community, but understanding just how important that balance is. Um, but with that said, I also know that when we're looking for a police chief and we got some great candidates, we're looking for the right leader at the right time. We're here in Grand Rapids, Michigan, 2022. You have lost uh, support from the NAACP in the city of Grand Rapids, Michigan and other nonprofits. When it comes to the shooting, officer related shooting you were involved in and the fact that you killed uh, not something but somebody, you killed a dream. Um, and me hearing you today, I do um, empathize with the post-traumatic stress. I do understand that you do understand that a life was lost. I do see the remorsefulness. But when we talk about it, and we can talk about the different organizations that said that this shooting, you know, was justified. But then at the same time, we don't talk about the court, of, the court of public opinion that was in the newspaper articles, not only the court of public opinion, but those that watched that shooting. So when you come to the city of Grand Rapids, we also have the court of public opinion. Will the city of Grand Rapids, if they hire you without the support of the NAACP, if they hire you where we have a revolution and movement going saying, hey, those agencies didn't always get it right. You know, if, if I drop the wedding cake at the reception of the five-star wedding, the chocolate cake, delivering it, and I trip and put it on the bride's wedding gown. That's going to be a problem. Yeah, I'm losing my job, or at least I won't be delivering the cake again. So the public has been saying in law enforcement, this is the only place where you can kill a person. You could kill a dream. You could kill a family member of, a, of, of citizens of that community, and not only can you get your job, you can rise to the police chief. I believe you're going to make a great police chief sometime, somewhere, but me living in the city of Grand Rapids, I have to ask you, without the support of the NAACP, and with what we're dealing with in our public, are you the right leader for our city at the right time? Yes, I am. Amen. And let me offer a little bit more substance to the answer. So it's unfortunate that um, the leader of the NAACP, an organization that I clearly respect deeply, historical and everything else, um, has taken that stance. It's unfortunate. And I'll also say that I understand his thought process and I understand his, his, uh, his reasoning. My only ask is that I, I be evaluated on the breadth of my career. Not only on an incident that happened in 1997, nearly 24 years ago, although traumatic, I'm not saying that it should ever be forgotten, but what I'm saying is evaluate everything since 1997. So I think, I am convinced as a matter of fact that anyone, anyone in this room, anyone listening, the leader of the NAACP, you yourself, 
let's sit down, let's have a conversation, and afterwards you will be convinced that I'm the right person for this job as well. I want to thank you, and, and I just want to say I look forward to those conversations, and as I speak for what I believe the majority of people in my community think, um, and that had to be honest, because this is very serious. The hiring of a police chief is about as serious as we get here in uh, government here in Kent County in the city of Grand Rapids, Michigan. So I had to ask the hard question. But at the same time, I do want to thank you for all of the service um, before 1997, before that day, and after that day, and let you know we do respect our police officers. Thank you very much, sir. Thank you. Two more questions, and then that'll be it. Hi, my name is Jason Fulton, and I'm a member of Chief Payne's Advisory Committee. We've heard it a few times tonight that communication is one of the keys to good policing. We haven't talked about what that consists of and how each of the candidates plan to do that. If you awarded the job of police chief, how are you planning to communicate with the community? Commissioner Womack kind of set that up a little bit with some of the stakeholders in the community. Um, but let's go bigger than that. The community in general, are you the type of person who relies solely on television? Or are you really the kind of person that's going to go into the community? Are you going to have those hard conversations? Great question. Thank you for answering and, and dovetailing uh, the commissioner's question as well. Um, and again, absolutely, I am a community-oriented officer and will be police chief. My entire time at District 7, and I use that example specifically because, again, um, there were a number of officers that I had, I, I worked with and supervised, but the mission was to get out in the community. I am not the type that uh, sits behind a desk and makes decisions. Um, I'm the type that goes out with an open door policy. I go out, others can come to me as well. I'm willing to meet anyone in any place to talk about the problems that need to be addressed. So communication, how will I communicate? Very effectively. Um, and it would be a number of strategies to, to um, um, communicate uh, with, with whoever needs to be, with whoever needs to receive a message, right? So uh, community specific, um, when block watch organizations hold meetings, when nonprofit organizations hold community related meetings, I will be there. I will be there. That's the backbone of my leadership style, to be there, meet everyone at the table to discuss the issues. Um, internal communications with the agency, um, I strongly believe in face-to-face. -face. Uh, I'm a people's person, so I like to dialogue, I like to engage, I like to shake hands outside of the requirements for, for this pandemic, right? Um, but I'm a people person. Um, so that would be my style of uh, communication, outward and inward. Thank you. Last question. Hello. Hi. My name is Gail Harvey, and I am um, external officer as well as an executive committee member with the NAACP. So uh, just to reiterate what Commissioner Womack said, we don't feel this should be a rushed process. We feel that this should have some time taken and that everyone has the ability to evaluate each one um, based on what they've done. Um, so that is our stance and we are never ever above coming to the table. We will absolutely sit down and talk and go over and listen to whatever is necessary. So that being said, I just I have a two-part question. There's currently an ongoing investigation with the Michigan Civil Rights uh, <coughs> since 2019. This investigation suggests an ongoing pattern of practice-related racial profiling. What steps would you take to move that investigation forward and bring about a meanable resolution for all impacted parties 
And are you willing to ask the DOJ to fully investigate and assist in resolving that investigation? Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you for coming forward and, and offering your perspective from the NAACP. Again, a phenomenal organization, deep, deep respect for all the work that's, that's done uh, there. So, so thank you. Um, and again, um, I am willing um, to sit at the table, this process aside, um, willing to sit at the table with um, you and your leadership to discuss my career and any other issues that, uh, that, that you know, you feel that needs to be addressed. Thanks. As it relates to the question, um, yes, I think that those type of investigations um, helps to build the community trust, right? So when the community knows that uh, those type of investigations are taking place and, and they take, you know, um, what some may be considered or what, what is an unreasonable amount of time, um, then that causes problems, right? Now, I have to say that I'm not very familiar with that particular investigation, and so the timeline um, may be appropriate. I don't know. But what I am saying is that, say for example, if complaints were brought to the agency, Grand Rapids PD, um, <laughs> about an officer, inappropriate conduct or something along those lines, it will be investigated thoroughly in a meaningful timeline. So they will not drag on, and I'm not saying that it happens now, I'd have to evaluate um, the process uh, that takes place here. But from my perspective, um, investigations on a small scale or on a large scale, federal investigations, um, I do believe should move along at the proper time frame. And yes, um, if appointed to the police chief, I would look into that case. Uh, to figure out where it is um, and what needs to be done to uh, bring it to a resolution. Okay. And uh, would you seek help, if necessary, with the DOJ? Would I seek help from the Department of Justice? Uh -huh. um, it's, it's something that I would need to evaluate. If, if, from my perspective, in consultation with all of you, in consultation with Mr. Washington, that that is the appropriate next step, then I have no problem pushing it forward. But again, that's something that needs to be a collaborative approach. It's not going to be Jutiki Jackson thinks that this should go to the DOJ alone and send it. Okay. Thank you. Thank you for your response, Inspector Jackson. And I want to remind uh, everyone here in the, in the commission chambers that we do have comment cards outside. Um, and fill those comment cards out and leave them behind. Uh, we appreciate your perspective. And with that having been said, I'm going to have um, Inspector Jackson provide a, a closing uh, statement briefly. Thank you again. Um, it is such an honor, uh, again, to be here. I know I said it in the opening, but, um, but it's true. One of the things that I want all of you and all the listeners what I want to resonate with you is that my policing career spans much further than the terrible incident in 1997, right? I ask that you all um, just take time to, uh, to review what materials you like to look at to confirm or, or deny some of the things. Um, but I'd also like for this to resonate with you. Throughout my presentation and probably throughout this process, you've all heard of uh, strategies, uh, um, collaborations that will be um, developed. I want you to know that these are things that I already did, right? These are things, these are strategies, these are relationship building blocks that took place already. I have the experience, and the knowledge, and the willingness to do it again. There is a great infrastructure here of nonprofit organizations, uh, clergy, and most important, all of you. It's quite evident that all of you care about your community, otherwise you wouldn't be here. So that's perfect, that's a perfect foundation to build and move neighborhoods forward to solve problems together. So again, thank you. This clearly um, is a 
transparent um, and community driven approach. So, so thank you. Thank you, Inspector Jackson. And lastly, I want to remind everyone, actually not remind, but tell everyone that there is an online survey on the city's website that uh, allows you to make comments um, and they're candidate specific. Um, and feel free to, to fill out that anonymous survey as well if you choose to do that. And for those who are still watching um, in the virtual world, um, go, to our, go to the city's website and you'll be able to see the survey as well. And with that, I'm going to turn it over to uh, City Manager Washington for the closing. All right, thank you, thank you, uh, Gary. Um, let, let's give uh, Gary a big hand for his work in helping us with this process. I want to thank the candidates, again, all of you for being here, and uh, it was very valuable to hear the questions and the responses. And uh, I do take all of that uh, seriously, and we'll uh, go back and. Um, look at some of the comments that are shared as uh, we continue to evaluate uh, the candidates and, and make the decision into the um, comment about um, taking time to do this right. I, I don't intend to uh, rush the decision because we're still in process. Uh, as I said earlier, there will be additional opportunities for the candidate to now meet members inside the police department as well as I uh, have uh, opportunity to tour see the city and we'll be uh, doing additional um, background uh, checking and following up on, on uh, to the information that was shared here. And so more than likely um, it's going to take a couple of weeks uh, before an announcement is made. And so we will we'll continue to do our due diligence, but I appreciate the feedback. There was a question that was asked earlier. I want to want to make sure we address that about the um, diversity of the the candidate pool. And um, what you should know is that at City of Grand Rapids, we we value diversity and inclusion in all of our hiring processes, and try to be very intentional to make sure that we cast a broad net. And uh, many times uh, we, we are successful as the last time we were able to uh, diversify the candidate pool. And I think that was the attempt uh, this time. Uh, I think the question was asked about gender diversity. And uh, that is something that we're trying to improve in all levels of government, particularly in public safety and the police department. And um, I think the candidate pool was not as diverse gender wise as, as uh, at least the finalist pool obviously recognizing here, but that does not diminish uh, the need to do that. And we're very proud to have made a historic, I am, that P Chief Payne has been proud to make a historic appointment in the police department to appoint our first female deputy police chief. And I think she's here tonight. Deputy Chief Rogers, thank you for being here tonight. And we look forward to continuing um, that kind of inclusion, in, and not only at the deputy level, but at senior levels in the department. So thank you for whoever asked that question earlier, Mr. Nashville, uh, for, for, for that question. And with that, uh, good night.